Um, tonight we have a talk from Dr. Donna Walk from Geisinger, and she's also part of the ASM Speakers Bureau. And she's gonna speak with us tonight about careers in microbiology, mainly with uh, medical microbiology, and along with some research aspects to that. So I hope you enjoy and feel free to ask questions. Thank you. All right, well, as she said, I'm Dr. Donna Walk. I'm the Systems Director of Clinical Microbiology at Geisinger Health Systems. In the back's my colleague, Dr. Raquel Martinez, who's the Director of Clinical Microbiology. And uh, she looks more like you than she looks like me, so uh, I'm sure you guys will have some questions for the both of us uh, after we're finished and um, get kind of the old person's perspective and the young person's perspective on careers in clinical microbiology. So I'll talk about first what is a clinical microbiologist, some career options, a little bit about postdoctoral programs if any of you are considering graduate school and uh, medical board certification in medical microbiology, which is uh, our path. I was asked by ASM to talk to you a little bit about the activities that we've done with the outreach in the community and a little bit about how I got to be um, in the job role that I'm in now. Um, pretty much in the, let's just say before the 90s, and I'll, that's as far as I'll go, I sat in your spot in the uh, Med Micro Club here at Penn State. And so how did I get from your chair to this, to this podium? I guess that's what we'll talk about today a little bit. Um, so first, what is clinical microbiology? Well, clinical microbiologists are a, gr uh, a portion or a subset of a larger group called clinical laboratory scientists, or CLS. Uh, some states call them MLS, medical laboratory scientists. They used to be always called medical technologists, and Penn State has a longstanding tradition of having a medical technology program here. Um, that's the one I graduated from before the 90s. Um, so it, in each state, it'll be a little bit different, but the essence is, is that these are um, basically diagnostic microbiology folk who are engaged in some form of clinical, medical, diagnostic, and or public health or related translational research. And so I'm going to try to cover all of the, the job options and how you would get to be one of those uh, people should that be an area that interests you. Clinical microbiologists oversee operations and practices. What kind of operations? Well, our job, um, Dr. Martinez and I oversee 70 clinical microbiologists throughout the Geisinger healthcare system in five different hospitals across a four to six hour driving range. And uh, their job on a daily basis is to isolate and identify the microbes that come from people's infections, whether they're in the hospital or they're coming into a clinic. And these microbial agents are probably things that are familiar to you, bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi, mycobacterium. And we do so from uh, blood, urine, fluids, sputum, stool. Uh, we are part of what's called the clinical pathology group. So um, when you watch uh, forensic TV shows and people are slicing up autopsy, that's part of the anatomic laboratory function. That is the organ-based function of a, of a medical laboratory or a forensics lab or a public health lab. We're kind of the secretions are us people. So if it's an excretion, we get it. If it's a body tissue, they usually get it. On the anatomic pathology side, most of those folks are MDs and they're uh, practicing pathologists. On the clinical side, you can either be an MD or a PhD to oversee those diagnostic operations and that PhD track is kind of, an, and it's associated operations is what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. The practices that we oversee range from what we call the pre-analytical, from the time somebody goes to the emergency room or a doctor's office and gets that throat swab or gets that tube of blood for culture or secretes that urine specimen for uh, urinary tract infection. We oversee that, the transport to the clinical laboratory, the testing and analysis of those uh, samples as we cultivate them in, in our incubators and grow the organisms that are infecting those people. Then we perform the antimicrobial testing and then we have to uh, also ensure that our laboratory reports are accessible, easily understood by the practicing physicians. That's called the post-analytical piece. 
the bulk of what we do is in the middle or the analytical piece. And, um, you know, that is where um, most of the effort and most of the impact lies. But on, on the other hand, we are responsible for those other things. And it doesn't matter how good your culture result is if the doctor can't understand the result you're giving them. So um, on a daily basis, we spend uh, about a third of our time in each of those areas. Clinical microbiologists oversee services that are critical to the well-being of our, our patients and enable the correct diagnosis to be made. About 70% of all uh, medical diagnoses are based on some form of laboratory tests. Now, that's not all microbiology, but it is your blood counts, your clotting factors, your liver enzymes, your cardiac enzymes. And that whole piece is what a medical technologist will do. Anything from cross-matching blood to uh, running the cardiac markers, looking for cancer cells in people's bloodstream. And infectious disease and clinical microbiology is a small set of, subset of that. But there are career tracks for microbiology majors, biochem majors, to take the medical board certification you need to work in that area. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit as, it, as it's going along. But these are the folks that are actually supplying the proper diagnoses so that the physician can walk in and say, you know, Mr. So-and-so, you have a blood infection, you're infected with this, we're going to give you this antibiotic and make you, make you well. The clinical microbiologists all also oversee laboratory personnel. Um, like I said, there are, you know, 40 to 70 clinical microbiologists in our system. They make all the daily decisions based on the instructions and the general parameters of infectious disease diagnosis that we give them. The clinical microbiology team is, you know, also kind of the linchpin, so to speak, and maybe I'm a little bit biased, but we support infection prevention. So how many people in the audience have ever heard of MRSA? Okay, it's all over the news. Each hospital is charged by the government to limit the amount of cross-contamination of MRSA or MRSA between its patients. The clinical microbiology lab is the, are the people that screen everybody that comes into a hospital, make sure they don't have MRSA in their nares. If they have MRSA in their nares, they go into protective isolation, um, and the nurses and the doctors gown and glove and wash their hands so that's not transmitted, one of our functions. The other function is um, antimicrobial stewardship. So we have computer algorithms that, because physicians tend to at times give the biggest, give out the biggest hammer in the tool chest. For antibiotics, you don't want to do that. You want to give the most targeted and least powerful antibiotic that will still kill that organism because you don't want to be responsible for increase, increasing antimicrobial resistance. We support those practices, as well as um, bed management. I mean, we are actually looking to try to make sure that we have enough beds in the hospital for the sickest people to come into. As you can imagine, in the flu season, everything gets jammed up, and the microbiology laboratory works with the bed management nurses to make sure there's um, people with the same infection can be cohorted at times. Uh, other times, they have to have private rooms, so we help manage that. And those are things that most lay people wouldn't think that the microbiology lab gets involved in, you know, but we do. Um, we generally use techniques such as culture, microscopic exam, biochemical panel testing, molecular and immunology tests, and uh, then we do susceptibility testing. Um, how many micro majors, I forgot to ask? Okay, so maybe in your med micro lab, you've had the Kirby Bauer disk diffusion and and antibiotic testing, that's a part of our, our practice, and that is information that's given to the physicians for treatment and also for uh, stewardship of the organisms uh, so as not to cause drug resistance, like I said. Now, there's a bunch of different subspecialties here. This is all a part of clinical microbiology. We have bacteriology, virology, mycobacteriology, which is tuberculosis and related organisms, Mycology, which is fungi, parasites, 
serology, which is the study of people's immune response to an invading infection, antimicrobial testing, and molecular microbiology. And still today, I'd say probably 50% of our diagnostic tests revolve around an auger plate that you're used to seeing in your clinical laboratories. And perhaps the other 50% revolve around nucleic acid testing to identify the genetic pattern of the offending organism in the patient's uh, specimens. I like to think of clinical microbiologists as the, the superheroes in all of this because they're kind of behind the scenes doing what they do. Um, they don't really have a lot of, we don't have a lot of patient contact. We're kind of the support crew, but um, at, at the end of the day, if those services crumble, the rest of the, if we're not there to hold up the bottom, so to speak, the rest of the uh, healthcare will suffer. The other thing that people don't uh, necessarily, they're not aware of, is that clinical microbiologists are generally the sentinels. Um, and what I mean by that is, has anybody ever heard of a sentinel chicken? Um, sentinel chickens are sometimes used in public health outbreaks where they put birds or animals out into the field to see if they get infected, and that becomes the, the radar, so to speak, the red flag that something's going on in the environment. Microbiologists in the hospital are generally the first persons that get to see the outbreaks that are going on whether that's an E. coli 0157H7, whether that's a Shigella, an act of bioterrorism where some, some crazy in a trench coat comes and sprays Shigella all over somebody's salad bar. Yeah, that's a true story. Uh, you know, the, the hospitals are the ones that say, hey, what's going on here? We think we have anthrax. You know, this doesn't look right. And then it goes to the public health department who then go to the press and say the Department of Health, you know, announces that. But clinical microbiologists are the ones that find those things first, and we work really closely with public health labs. We're also the kind of the first people to identify uh, drug-resistant trends and, and things of that nature. So everything from swine flu, um, in fact, some of my friends in San Diego were the first to actively uh, discover the swine flu in the United States. So. We were working on a project um, called PCR mass spectrometry, where we used molecular methods to amplify target and uh, then mass spectrometry to weigh the uh, amplicon that's produced by the polymerase chain reaction and identify it based on the weights of the amplicon created. And we were part of uh, uh, Southern Arizona, California, and border state surveillance system kind of with sentinel chickens, except their sentinel chickens were people that were kind of just coming in for the doctor for no reason and getting a, a, agreeing to put a swab up their nose to be tested for respiratory viruses. And so San Diego Naval Health Center was working with our, our team and uh, said, this is a flu, but it doesn't look like anything we've ever seen before. Send it to the CDC, got it sequenced, and in a few days the whole country was you know, talking about swine flu. So um, those kind of things are, are interesting. They're, they have an impact. And at the end of the day, you kind of feel good about being able to facilitate some of these discoveries and, and being able to protect the public health in the ways that we can. Um, we don't do the food and environmental testing, per se, in the hospitals. So you won't see us testing ground beef or water specimens but we collaborate with the public health and environmental microbiologists who do, the food microbiologists who do. And some of the same technologies that we use are also used by those. So the background is very useful for anybody with a microbiology degree. I'd say that microbiologists are also um, by nature forced to be very collaborative because uh, if you recall all the different people I talk to that we interface with on a daily basis, pharmacists, nurses, administrators, public health officials, safety um, officials in the organization, finance people. Um, we have a lot of interplay with all of the healthcare system, and microbiology services are very expensive. So anytime we can improve our laboratory testing to the betterment of a patient outcome, um, we, we gather the evidence to show the impact and the improvement to patient care 
And so we do a lot with education for nurses and uh, phlebotomists and, and the whole healthcare team, educating physicians and gathering this evidence-based intervention data. Um, we're also pretty involved in the community in which we live because we're close to the public health departments and we're always looking to improve uh, the community that we live in. Uh, this is a shot of my old hospital in Tucson, Arizona where I worked in the downtown Tucson area. And at that point, you know, here I'm kind of one of many. When I was in Arizona, there were two clinical doctoral microbiologists in the whole state. So we really helped every hospital from the Navajo Indian Reservation to the big university academic health centers. Um, wasn't our job to do so, but it was the right thing to do, and most of the clinical faculty will do those kinds of things. We also are charged with assuring quality. Many of our colleagues will go into the FDA, who has to review the results of new diagnostic testing, um, EPA. There's several laboratory guidelines. Uh, the College of American Pathologists are uh, responsible for uh, inspecting hospitals and diagnostic laboratory. Clinical Lab Standards Institute sets the national and international standards for clinical microbiology practices, among others. Um, we work with the FDA, the EPA, the USDA, the NIH, and pretty much any, any government body, the CDC, we work with quite a bit, the Center for Disease Control. And all of those regulations are aimed at ensuring compliance, uh, ensuring quality, and ensuring safety of our employees and the other healthcare personnel. One of my favorite jobs, although I struggled with STAT 250, is it still called STAT 250 here? Yeah, so I hated that class. <laughs> and uh, now that's my favorite part of my job, um, is taking massive amounts of data and analyzing it for trends in antimicrobial resistance in um, mortality. Even some of the things we do drop intensive care unit mortality. There's nothing more satisfying except maybe, you know, being a parent and having friends and family. But in the workplace, there's not too many things more satisfying than um, seeing that an intervention you've done has actually saved somebody's life. And clinical microbiologists get to do that almost on a daily basis. Anything from massive amounts of data where we analyze trends in mortality, length of stay, drug resistance, to you know, just a single person who we look at a, a blood culture bottle and say, you know, this stuff in this kid's blood is mouth flora. It doesn't belong in somebody's blood. Many times I have to call the police at, in my job and say, you know, we suspect foul play. And then the police will set up a camera in the patient's room and they will watch a mother who's mentally ill inject toilet water into her kid's IV pole and cause uh, or collect spit and put it into their IV line. It goes from massive amounts of data to looking for one little piece of data that gives you the tip off that you have to help somebody. And that's, I think, what one of the coolest parts of doing the job that we do. We work a lot with, uh, with those, uh, the whole organization and the State Department to be able to do those things. Clinical microbiology and translational research is not something that went together more than maybe five to seven years ago. Um, when a new, when a professor at a, at a college or a bioindustry scientist designs a new laboratory diagnostic, it's done so in what we call the research lab setting, the state of the art. People get grants and do crazy cutting edge science as a proof of concept of a scientific principle. But those techniques are not always reproducible enough that anybody can do them and get the same data. Maybe it, maybe the test reacts differently in high humidity than low humidity. You know, we had, when I was in Tucson, um, it's very dry there and not all laboratory tests worked in the desert where they might work back east. Um, so 
on the journey from the research lab to what we call the long and winding road to diagnostic laboratory operations, the, cl the clinical lab across the top of this slide, we're not state of the science, we're state of the law. The law says FDA has the authority to govern the diagnostic testing, and if we're going to do that diagnostic testing, we better darn well get it right or our butts will be canned and in jail. <laughs> so we are uh, governed by the CLIA law, the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act. We are looking at proof of utility, proof of medical principles. Is this test accurate and does it have an impact to patient care? Because it can be accurate, but if it's not for a pathogen we care about, then we really have no business charging the patient or running it. Um, so we look for medical utility. Most of our tests require FDA review and approval. And then the FDA says, okay, biotech company or spin-off professor's company, you're accurate, you have medical utility, you can sell your test to hospitals. Then along comes molecular testing. And it's, it takes this, this top clinical lab area where standard practices, quality assistant systems, proven accuracy that's reproducible no matter day or night, hot or cold, humid or dry, proven outcomes and indicators, and it says, okay, um, let's go an example. I lived in Tucson, Arizona, so we have a bad disease, a fungal disease there of the lung called valley fever. Valley fever affects a lot of people in Southern California and Arizona, but it's, there's not enough people for that company who might want to create a new test for valley fever to plunk down the 30 to $50 million it takes to take something through the FDA. So they're never going to get a test that's FDA cleared for valley fever. The law says that as laboratory directors, we're allowed to do what's called a laboratory develop test. So we can design our own molecular assay, test it on our patients, and offer it but we don't have the benefit of all the infrastructure of biotechnology, and we have a lot of work to do if we are going to be able to try to mimic those outcomes. Nevertheless, that is the state of the science in medicine right now. Um, only 20% of the labs across the country have any kind of molecular testing. We work in laboratories where it's a given, it's standard of care, but little community hospitals 80% of them still don't have molecular. There's a huge need for career scientists like yourself that have molecular background to blend with the medical community and offer those services. Well, when we're dealing with public health, we not only report that, we do some tracking. Our laboratory submits data on a daily basis of reportable diseases that are the law, and they range from sexually transmitted diseases, gonorrhea, uh, to anthrax, a bioterrorism agent, to just this run-of-the-mill flu and respiratory viruses that we report so that the Public Health State Department in Pennsylvania can then compile that data for Pennsylvania and submit it to the CDC, which compiles it for the whole United States. So if you go on the website, if you Google influenza and Center for Disease Control, you'll get a weekly mapping of all the viruses that are all the flu cases that are in the United States, and it's all supplied through this chain. We help manage outbreaks in our hospitals. We recognize and control uh, these outbreaks at the community level. So um, I remember one time we had a, we had a group of, it's like some kind of family reunion, right? And they all went down to one of the lakes down by Tamaqua, and they were all swimming, hundreds of them and somebody had Shigella. Now, if you know anything about Shigella, it only takes one to 10 organisms per milliliter to get everybody sick. So we had literally hundreds of people with really bad diarrhea the next day. The public health officials would collaborate with the hospitals to be able to mass produce the cultures that are needed to identify which people are infectious so they can stop the outbreak. So we work with them. And we, uh, at times, will characterize both the phenotypic and the molecular uh, testing. The same company that uh, spawned the device that detected the first swine flu was also the, um, 
the technology that identified the Amerithrax, uh, the source of the Amerithrax outbreak in Frederick, Maryland at the US AMRID. Um, so they looked at the genetic differences in the anthrax and they were able to determine that the mixture of anthrax was unique to the one laboratory in Maryland. And so um, those kind of things also go on. Clinical microbiologists and epidemiology. Some of my colleagues, both at the bachelor's, master's, and PhD level, will become an epidemiologist, either one that works with the public health department or one that works in a hospital. Epidemiologists study the factors that affect health and illness and serve as the foundation for innovation, uh, in, interventions. This is what they call the epidemiological triangle in public health. You have an agent, which will be your microbe, you have an environmental factor, and you have a host, which is generally humans in the case of uh, public health. Epidemiologists will track the outbreak, try to determine any of the characteristics about any of those three points in the triangle and try to break that chain. So if the microbe is passing through food to the host, they're going to get rid of the food and break that chain. If the microbe is, is passing from water, they're going to chlorine the pool or whatever and uh, break that chain. Um, we had a, a, an investigation when I was working or studying at the Minnesota Department of Health where a group of um, a family came down with gastrointestinal anthrax because their cows started falling over in the field and they asked their local veterinarian, well, you know, this cow just dropped dead in the field, is it okay to eat it? Mm -hmm. And the veterinarian said, sure, go ahead and eat that. Well, the whole family came down with symptomology. Turns out other cows started to drop and they were able to intervene between the host and the agent by providing antibiotics and saving that family. So that's what epidemiologists do. And they will either do that in the hospital with MRSA, vancresistin enterococcus, and Clostridium difficile respiratory viruses, or they'll do it out in the community with things uh, that are foodborne or waterborne. In research, clinical microbiologists are very useful these days because of all the biomedical uh, research money and uh, what we call the translational re research, taking things from the bench and putting them into the hospital for patient care. They call it bench to bedside testing. Many of the laboratory organisms we identify um, are clinically unimportant. And so we need to be able to sort those from the ones that are medically pathogenic. In, I, was, I was in a, a national seminar with a woman who was one of the top worldwide experts of Neisseria gonorrhea pathogenesis. And someone in the audience, probably one of the freshmen, asked her, what other organisms are in the vaginal tract? And she didn't know. She was an, the, the, one of the world expert. Clinical microbiologists could name them off intent, because that's what we do. We separate the pathogens from the non-pathogens. And so we have a role in research advising researchers who, whose life it is to study one enzyme or one organism and don't really care about all the other stuff. But that stuff is important uh, at times. We're searching for new or forgotten infectious diseases. We discover new pathogens in our laboratories all the time. And we are looking to develop new diagnostic capabilities, help research teams in bioindustry that are making these new technologies. And then, you know, as I mentioned before, actually document the improvement to care. Geisinger, as well as other healthcare organizations, are looking to try to give the best care at the, the least price possible to get a control on the healthcare spending. And these evidence-based interventions are the things that we will be doing that in the laboratory to be able to help that effort. Now, if you do have a molecular background, as I said, you might be very much in demand. There are two, just like there's anatomic and clinical pathology I talked to you about, there's molecular diagnostics, which is kind of the clinical pathology realm. That's molecular microbiology. That's where most of the money and the action and the test variety is. Uh, probably 85% of all molecular diagnostics is med micro. 
Histocompatibility, that's kidney transplant. Molecular hematopathology is blood cancers. Molecular genetics and inherited disease, cystic fibrosis, uh, those types of um, congenital um, diseases would be covered in that laboratory. And then molecular pathology aligns with the anatomic cancer tissue pieces, oncology, cytology, and of course, the CSI type of forensic testing, which is usually not in a hospital laboratory. Who works in the clinical laboratory? We have post high school phlebotomists, post high school laboratory assistants. We have associate degree, two year uh, CLTs or histotechnicians. We have a ton of four year degrees, uh, medical technologists, medical lab scientists, cytologists, um, histotechs. And then at the master's and PhD and MD level, we have directors, operational directors, administrative directors, coordinators, and, and the medical staff. According to the U.S. labor statistics in 2010, uh, 12, over 12,000 new laboratorians are needed in hospitals per year, but there's only 4,000 coming out. That's an 8,000 shortfall every year since 2010, and that trend has not changed. Um, so there's a lot of jobs out there. The tricky part is to find out how to get the medical certification you need, and I'm going to be able to tell you some of that. CLS are the, a large component of healthcare. After nurses and doctors, lab people are the third largest group, and over a quarter of a million clinical lab professionals work in the United States, uh, with over 7 billion tests in about 171,000 laboratories. Medical lab science or medical technology is an excellent starting point for all of these things. You want to be a physician, and you come out of medical lab science training and you already know the 80% of what you need to diagnose your patient, I would teach in the med school in Arizona and the med techs in the room would come up, you know, they're joking around, they're laughing, everybody else is freaking out trying to memorize. Medical technologists already have that information. Uh, dentistry, biomed technology, basic sciences, sales and marketing, there's a lot of need for science people who have good communication skills, who want to do marketing, scientific sales, scientific technical support, uh, law, patent law, um, education, and lots of other things um, that you can do with uh, an MLS degree. Now for those of you who would like to go on to postgraduate programs in clinical microbiology, the American Academy of Microbiology um, has what's called a CPEP program, the Committee on Postgraduate Educational Programs. And they develop standards for uh, DOs, PhDs, MDs, uh, PsyDs, and they will take board registry of those folks. After their PhD, you do a clinical um, microbiology fellowship. I, I'll tell you where I did mine in a minute um, and tell you my track. And this training program prepares you to take the medical boards that are required for you to be a medical director of a microbiology laboratory. The length of training in med micro is one to two years. And you learn all of the subspecialties of med micro when you're in that training. And you do, um, you see patients, you uh, participate in public health outbreaks. So you're a part, you're working with pharmacists, nurses, infectious disease physicians as part of the healthcare. Uh, practice team. Then, once board certified, you can go on to direct the whole operation in a clinical laboratory, and then you are the interface to the rest of the public health community and physicians and, and whatnot. And that, that goes from Lyme disease to MRSA to um, uh, surgical side infections in the operating room. Um, we just uh, the advent of uh, proteomic testing has now hit the medical microbiology laboratory as well as DNA sequencing. So Dr. Martinez and I find unusual pathogens that we didn't even know existed almost any day. You know, you, once you have the skills to be able to identify uh, these new pathogens with technology, then you can, uh, you can diagnose infections that would have gone unnoticed before or stop outbreaks that would have been 
unnoticed before. For those of you who aren't a micro major, you can also have a doctoral degree in a chemical, biological, or clinical lab science, a PhD in clinical lab science, and then you can apply for the microbiology boards, or if you're more interested in the non-micromolecular, there is a PhD level that's more of a genetic testing uh, type of PhD where you can be certified by the American Board of Medical Genetics or the American Board of Clinical Chemistry. So much like the microbiologists have a track, if you're a clinical chemist with a PhD, you can be board certified in clinical chemistry, clinical immunology, and a number of, uh, and clinical genetics. So, oops, sorry, wrong way. I listed some uh, websites there that might give you some more information about these programs. And uh, this will be, I, I believe it's being taped for your website so you can get back on here and look for yourself. So I'll kind of breeze through the story of my life. It's not a very exciting one, but it'll give you an example of how you can progress through uh, the process and uh, get to, to whatever part of that road that you'd like to get to. Um, and there's two quotes I'd like you to ponder. I, when I was in your seat, all I ever heard was, never underestimate the power of a plan. You know, chart your career. You have to know what you're, you have to see it to get there. If you don't know where you're going, any road will do, blah, blah, right? Um, and I guess that's partly true, but I also want to caution you in the audience that sometimes the world points you in a direction. You just have to be aware enough to wake up and see where it's pointing. I was the kind of person, well, first of all, I'm first generation um, college in my family. Grew up in a little town of 400 people in northeastern Pennsylvania. Didn't know what broccoli was till I came here to Penn State. So kind of Appalachian, almost. No offense to any of the Appalachians in the audience. I never anticipated being a PhD or going down that route. And I, in fact, I remember telling people, why would you ever want to go back to school when you can get a job with a bachelor's degree? And I loved my job with, as a bachelor's degree. I worked in medical microbiology and blood bank for a while. And then, uh, you know, it came kind of to a fork in the road where my boss said to me one day, you know, you're, you're pretty much one of the best supervisors we have in the laboratory. You're the only woman supervisor we have in the laboratory. And you make $14,000 less than everybody else, so you need to go back to school and get your master's degree, and then I'll correct your wages. Well, that didn't seem like a too tough of a choice for me. So that pointed me in the direction of my master's degree. Um, so I started out here at Penn State, did my med tech internship, um, at Geisinger, and then due to my boss correcting the, the wages for the female supervisor, went back and got my master's in health administration from Wilkes University. And uh, worked at Geisinger Medical Center for most of my career, uh, probably 13, 14 years, till another path in the road uh, kind of presented to me. Um, I became a single parent of a two-year-old and only had one skill set that I knew of, which was microbiology. So I took myself back to get a PhD in the hopes of you know, kind of making a better life for my child. Um, and I had back surgery at that time, and that's how I landed up at the University of Arizona, because it was the only place I didn't have back pain. Turns out um, it was a great place for me. And uh, I worked in the laboratory of Dr. Charles Sterling, who is well known for waterborne parasites. Got my degree in kind of medical parasitology and um, didn't have any back pain there. <laughs> Studied and uh, raised my daughter there. Uh, and so after that, I applied for the medical microbiology fellowship program at Mayo Clinic. And uh, lo and behold, I did get in there. So. Back to the cold, I spent two years there. That's where I did the PhD ABMM. The American Board of Medical Micro is the board that allows you to be you know, the medical director. And uh, kind of makes us equivalent 
uh, on the organizational chart to sort of a clinical pathologist. So my peers are other PhDs and MDs, and most PhDs that go through the rigor of your uh, PhD and your traditional postdoc um, don't even know that this option exists, and this option is probably uh, twice to three times the wage uh, on the medical side that, that will occur for most PhDs on the academic side. So that being said, I love, when I was in Arizona, I realized I really like doing research, and I wish I could do that full time. Uh, but I love my job now, too, and I can pay the bills a little bit better. Um, so it, it worked out for me. Um, this translational science, or what they call applied science, is often not something that you gain recognition for in graduate school. I had people say to me, why are you going to Mayo Clinic? You're way too smart to do applied sciences. Well, I have to pay my bills, and I like it, you know? <laughs> so those are two good reasons, right? So um, from there, I went back to Tucson, Arizona, where I got a job in the department a pathology, started the medical genetic fellowship program. At that time, it was the 12th in the nation to be accredited. And we had the Arizona Molecular Diagnostic Research Laboratory and then, or Diagnostic Laboratory, and then my research laboratory, the Infectious Disease Research Corps. And I stayed there from 2001 until last year when I moved here to Pennsylvania. Uh, during my tenure there, I became full time at the U of A in 2008 went from assistant professor to associate professor, division chief of medical microbiology, and principal investigator in the new building uh, there called the Bio5 Institute, which was one of the first in the country to, to actually have a focus on translational applied research. So all of a sudden, we went from sort of the outcast to the people who are getting industry grants and working with the FDA. and it, it was okay. We didn't have to be embarrassed of that anymore, so to speak. Um, I became a clinical research scholar by going back again to do um, some research training and a certificate program in the uh, College of Public Health. Um, right about that time, my daughter, who was then in junior high, said, Mom, you're like in the 27th grade. Just give it up already. So <laughs> I did. <laughs> did my research laboratory where we focus on uh, healthcare-acquired infections, sepsis, and uh, was very happy there. We, we had a little educational outreach group called the Germ Cats because we're the Wild Cats, and we're still in the final, four, we're in the like Sweet 16 or something. Um, so we did kindergarten through 80-year-olds. Anybody who wanted to know about infectious disease, we would do science fairs and outreach to the community, um, and that was a part of our research initiative. In 2013, I came to Geisinger, where we have the clinical laboratory in a research setting in the Weiss Center for Research. I'm now not a graduate, an alumni of uh, Wilkes University. I'm faculty there in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, a professor in pharmaceutical sciences. We work with the research center on the left, the evidence-based interventions biostatistical core in the middle, and the Integrated Healthcare Services Organization to try to make informed and educated decisions about what kind of laboratory practices and disease management we will have. And so my whole life has kind of come around in a funny way to the place where I started in my med tech senior year at Geisinger Medical Center where I did my med tech training. And, um, you know, never thought I'd leave Pennsylvania. That was the first never. Never thought I'd go back to school. That was the second never. Never, never thought I'd come back to Pennsylvania because I loved it in Arizona so much. So I never say never anymore because whatever I say never to is exactly what happened. Um, we have a, a translational research lab called the Center for Infectious Disease Diagnostics and Research. We focus on uh, translational research and integrated laboratory support. We have a shared purpose with the hospital laboratory. This allows Dr. Martinez and myself to take summer interns, um, perhaps someday master's students. We have a postdoctoral uh, fellow in our department, and so it allows us to keep an academic track, publications in the setting of 
um, our normal medical service and diagnostic um, service that we do for the hospital. Our mission is to improve the detection and prevention of infectious diseases by developing and implementing and documenting the benefit of new laboratory techniques. The one beef I have with my scientific colleagues is kind of part of the nature of them and who we are. We're kind of the people in the basement doing this work for the betterment of the patients, and we're not like horn-blowing kind of people. We're, we're serious, we're scientists, and what we forget to do is tell the world how important the laboratory testing is. And without that, you don't get the budget you need, you don't get the recogni recognition that you need for your department to continue to flourish. And so the evidence-based research, by publicizing the good things we do for patients, that's a way we can let people know that the lab is there, let smart young scientists like yourself know that this is a viable and very fulfilling career, and um, maybe get some resources along the way. Our tagline is advancing diagnostics and saving lives because everything we do is focused on the betterment of patient care, decreasing morbidity and mortality, and by moving diagnostics forward, uh, we can get there. Our laboratory uh, is based on quality assurance principles. We collect specimens from patients and discard specimens. We evaluate automation and molecular tools in the CEDAR uh, research laboratory. That data goes into the FDA in a process called a clinical trial, and that is the funded process by which uh, uh, an industry sponsor can get their technique reviewed by the FDA who initials allows it to be sold to clinical laboratories and then uh, assessed for interventional purposes. The kinds of people we have are molecular biologists, epidemiologists, biostatisticians, master's degrees. We have to have a, a specimen data bank manager who, uh, I have 70,000 frozen specimens of different infectious diseases that have to be managed and they're all in Arizona now. <laughs> but, we're recreating the same thing in Pennsylvania. We have human subjects for compliance, for privacy. Uh, we have lawyers for tech transfer that we work through, finance and grants, grants managers, and a whole host of different people in the research side. We generally participate in multi-center clinical trials. So right now, we're taking nasal swabs from around the country and, and then sometimes around the globe who come to our laboratory for testing to provide the data to the FDA. We have over 50 collaborators nationwide, and uh, like I said, we have a microbial biorepository of saved specimens so that we have the different types of organisms that we need uh, to perform our research. Our whole goal is to have the molecular testing in the laboratory drive rapid results that can go to pharmacy and infectious disease to allow the patient to have an intervention that will be a more targeted or a better antimicrobial or a, a removal of anti-immunosuppressant ther anti therapy. So we want to become the driving force that allows that intervention to occur. And that is, in essence, what all clinical laboratory scientists are, are trying to do on a daily basis. So what is a clinical microbiologist? We work in hospitals and research laboratories. You're not going to see us at the patient bedside, but we're behind the scenes trying to do our best to make sure those lives are saved, you know, like one lab test at a time. So next time you have somebody in the hospital and they're in protective isolation or they come down with an infectious disease, remember who's down in the basement with no windows and no walls and there are no windows and no doors half the time uh, working away to get those get those results out. So thank you for your kind attention. Obviously, I can't do any of this by myself. Uh, we have a whole team of people. And uh, you know, if you have further questions, uh, Dr. Martinez and I will stick around for some questions and uh, then contact us anytime we can. You want to know what any of these, any of the people that are in our group do on a daily basis, I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be invited, and thanks again. Yeah.